Today we're going to talk about the importance of strategic planning within a business and how companies can equip their leadership teams in order to deliver on their strategic plan. So welcome to Profile 3 TV and today we're joined by John from Linkubator. So John, thank you very much for coming in. Hi Karen, thank you. you. you oh, brilliant, thank you. You'd mind telling us a little bit about yourself and your, your background? Yeah. Um, well, I'm managing director of a business consultancy in Belfast called Linkubator. Um, I started my early career in the medical devices sector and spent a lot of time in sales roles. Uh, and I suppose I still see myself as a salesman at heart. Uh, although the part of the business that I'm probably most involved in now in Linkubator would be in our leadership development and in strategic development for clients. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And, and what, what does your role entail and what, what do you do? How do you help companies? Um, I suppose the bulk of my time is spent with clients, uh, typically in the client's business and normally working with either their senior management team or with middle managers within the company. Uh, and how it, how our work uh, manifests itself, if you like, or what it looks like in the real world, mm -hmm. uh, is that we facilitate sessions quite often with directors or senior managers in a business to help them to plan where they want to go as a business. Uh, I think it's a, a pretty common frustration and a pretty common challenge for a lot of people, in particular in SMEs or small medium enterprises, that uh, the business can run the management team rather than the management team are running the business. Mm -hmm. uh, and that daily grind of emails coming in, product to get out the door, supplier issues, customer issues, um, quite often that can absorb all of the, the thinking time from the senior management team. And something I suppose that's it's an important responsibility for anybody in a senior role in a business to have front and centre is that their primary role is to ensure that the business in the long term achieves its goals. It's not just about getting product out tomorrow or making sure the lorries get filled by Friday. It's to ensure that ultimately the shareholders see the return in the business that they want from their asset. Uh, so that's the strategy piece, if you like, uh, and that's pro probably absorbs about half of my client facing time. Uh, and on the leadership development side, we work with companies to um, Again, facilitate is a good word, uh, to facilitate cohorts of managers to look at their own personal leadership capabilities, their strengths and their weaknesses when it comes to leading other people. And we help them to come up with their own action plan and things that they can try or, or different practices that they can try to adopt to ultimately get the best out of their people. Uh, and again, I think that that middle management layer, that sort of leadership development piece, uh, quite often that can be crowded out as well just from daily activity. Mm -hmm. Managers who have responsibility for perhaps five or six people on their team um, can become so absorbed in that frontline executive activity that it's easy to neglect their sort of pastoral role, that um, paternal or maternal role that they have to make sure that everybody on their team is achieving their best and doing their best and is motivated, is loyal, uh, knows what they're doing and why they're doing it. And whilst those might sound like quite fundamental, almost obvious or patronising questions for any manager to be mindful of, uh, I think the real world sometimes pushes those questions uh, to the back of, of managers' minds. Uh, and it's not that people don't want to manage their people well. I think it's just sometimes that the the, the noise that comes from day-to-day -day operations in a business can quite often drown those questions out. That's incredible. I'm just thinking, you know, you've got big companies mm -hmm. that obviously, but even all the way down to small companies or even individuals mm -hmm. need to have a, a good balance of operational and yeah. strategy and, and foresight going forward. So yeah. incredible. So I'm thinking about myself here. So I, I would be traditionally an operator yeah, and yeah. enjoy Yep. you know, delivering and shipping and working with the team. Yeah. And I really have to focus hard to think of the strategy and the long term. And that's probably uh, something that I don't do uh, enough of. So if there's companies like that, yeah. uh, like ourselves, who yeah. enjoy, uh, who but especially people who've built their own business, mm -hmm. you're so used to doing uh, all the job and doing all the work and you're growing up and up and up. But 
more and more being sucked into the management side of it. Uh, is there any advice or, or thoughts that you would have around that? Well, I'm going to make your your day, Kieran. <laughs> okay. um, because we, I'm, I'm going to send you through a, a little slide, actually, by email that describes what I'll just describe to you now verbally. Um, but what you're talking about is the challenge. Uh, really, it's a challenge about how we manage our time mm -hmm. when we are in a management or we have responsibility for other people in that management role. Mm -hmm. And we have a neat little workshop that we run on our leadership program mm -hmm. that talks about how much of your time do you spend leading? Okay, so capital L. How much of your time do you spend managing? Uh, and when we say managing, we mean looking after how the team are performing. Mm -hmm. Leading being how much of your time are you devoting to where are we going mm -hmm. as a team? And then the third letter, the third bottom band is how much of your time do you spend operating? When people are early in their leadership career, they'll spend a tiny amount of their time in the leadership piece. So L will be very small, mm -hmm. M will be a little bit bigger. The bulk of their time, maybe 60, 70, 80% of your day, the actual hours of the day, is spent doing frontline operations. Even though you are a, let's say, a supervisor or a frontline leader, the bulk of your time is in that operating piece. The challenge that a lot of us have to struggle with, and I suppose what we help a lot of managers think about through our, our leadership program, um, Lead Like an Owner, I'll just give you the plug right now, um, through our Lead Like an Owner program, mm -hmm. is we help people understand that the more senior you become, the greater your responsibilities uh, grow, if you like, in the business, then that proportion has to change, that LMO proportion has to change. More of your time has to be spent on the L, more of your time has to be spent on the M, and you have to sacrifice time that was previously spent on the O, on the operating. And that's a really hard thing to do. I mean, the, the, the thing that we found in, in workshops when we're talking to managers about this, the big difficulty that we have in letting go of that operational side of our, our work is that, A, we're really good at it. You know, quite often that's why we got to be a manager, is we were brilliant at the operating. Um, the other component is that quite often it's tangible, the feedback that you get from that operating. So you get to go home at the end of the day thinking, I really put a shift in today. You know, look at all the stuff I did, look at all the calls I made, look at all the client meetings I had, I'm awesome. And whenever you start sacrificing that O for the L and the M, what managers and leaders find is that they'll go home at the end of the day and they don't have that tangible feedback. The management piece or the leadership piece that they maybe spent a lot of their day doing involved talking to people or listening to people. So you find yourself in the car on the way home and all you can think of is, well, all I did was listen to a bunch of people today. And that doesn't necessarily give us that satisfaction that we used to get from seeing, you know, boxes going out the door um, or being able to tick off a whole bunch of um, client meetings that we had. Um, so I think that's that partly explains the challenge and why it's difficult for us to let go of the operating piece. But essentially, that's the the challenge that you're you're describing there. Yeah. And you've actually just you've actually uh, talked about my journey home most evenings. <laughs> like, okay, what, do do do? what do they do? You're well, right, actually. Yeah. Before today's out, <laughs> you'll you'll get that little model sent <laughs> through to you, um, and I'll I'll talk to you again about how how do we do something about it how do we change those proportions incredible and then uh, and as you say it's the operator so we're traditionally operators mm -hmm. business owners and that's our comfort zone and yep. our expertise yep. and actually letting letting go is hard sometimes you, you have to let go yeah, so. absolutely right and it's a if we if we don't if we're not able to let go mm -hmm. we very quickly plateau we hit a ceiling because we become the bottleneck we become the constraint yeah. on the business um, and another topic, if you like, that frequently comes up on, on the Lead Like an Owner program is communication in a business. I don't think we've ever worked with a client um, or with even within any participant in a client company who hasn't said, you know, communication in this place isn't what it needs to be. You know, one of the big frustrations I have in my job is I don't get enough information from my colleagues or it's too hard for me to communicate what I need to to other people in the business. And communication is something that as a business grows, 
the, the business's approach to communication needs to become more and more and more proactive the bigger it gets because you have more complexity, you've got different departments now, you've got maybe even different sites and you can get away with an awful lot when everybody's in the same port of cabin. Mm -hmm. A lot of accidental communication just happens because you're all sitting beside each other. You'll overhear a conversation and you'll go, ah, Sarah, who was that you're on the phone with? Oh, it's just, you see next time you're talking to them, why don't you mention whatever? Or, oh, I, I think I could help you with that. I, I just heard you having a chat with Alan there about this, that and the other. And that accidental communication allows a lot of little sparks to create value in a small business as it grows. But as it grows, those sparks stop happening by accident because you lose that very natural human communication just because people are spread out and they're busy and they have their own bit to focus on. And um, That's frequently a, a very valuable topic for managers to explore. How can I become more proactive in how I communicate with my team and how my team communicates with other teams? And how can we involve other departments? Um, maybe um, a sales team can think about how do we involve more of the production people in our monthly sales meeting. That can be an incredibly rich thing to do, both for your production department, but also for the sales department, because it helps people learn about a world that they don't really see very much because they're not in the same port of cabin with production anymore. They're on a different site you know, half an hour down the road. Um, but it's a fascinating area, and I think it is a constant struggle. You know, there's no silver bullet to this. There's not a, a kind of a cheat sheet yeah. where you can just say, oh, well, let's do that, that, and that, and then forever life will be grand. Um, if only life were that simple. Of course, that's it. So uh, that's when that was my next question, actually. Is there is there a switch then? It's not a switch, it's a gradual improvement. It, it's a gradual improvement. Uh, I mean, continuous improvement is a term that I think a lot of people in business will be familiar with. Um, another phrase that we like to uh, use in several of our programs uh, is the aggregation of marginal gain. Now, that's just a fancy way of saying do lots of little things a little bit better, um, but aggregation of marginal gain sounds fancy, so we'll, we'll stick with that. Um, and it was a, a term adopted by um, Dave Brailsford, the, the head of the British cycling team, I think in the Beijing Olympics. But the concept is just for a team to try and better itself, not by transforming the world or not by finding that one switch or that, that one huge invention or the innovation with a capital I, but looking for innovation with a lowercase i. What are the little things that we can do a little bit better? One of the things that the British cycling team did to get a teeny edge was that they washed their hands more often than the other teams that they were competing with. Now you think, they washed their hands? Well, so? It's a bike race. It doesn't matter how often you wash your hands. But it does. Because if you've got four years to prepare for an Olympic race, one race, four years, you've got 1,300 or 400 and what odd days in which you can train. If you wash your hands more often than everybody else, you will get sick less than everybody else. You won't get the tummy bug one of those weekends. The other teams will. That lets you train point not 0.1% extra than they get to train. But in a cycling race, 0.01% of an advantage is 0.01% of an advantage. And if you, that's a hundredth of a second, I suppose, is maybe a, forgive my mathematics, but you know what I mean, yeah. it's an edge. And continuous improvement is about teams uh, feeling or understanding that they have a responsibility to look for those little edges, no matter where they might be. Whether it be that a business thinks, look, why don't we offer the flu jab to our staff this winter? Now, we're not going to make everybody get it if they don't want to get it, but let's just offer it for free. The company will fund it. The flu jab costs a tenner a shot. Now, if you can stop one person getting flu and missing work for a week, and it's not that they want to stay home with the flu, um, that will make a tangible difference to the business. That, that's a gain. But it's nothing to do with our packaging process, with our supply chain management, with our internal admin processes. It's like the washing the hands. 
thing. So continuous improvement in this aggregation of marginal gain, I think, is a, a topic that quite often gets us to look at things a wee bit differently, but ultimately it can give a business that little edge over its competitors. That makes perfect sense. And again, we're, we're something we're looking at and, and maybe working towards uh, without even knowing and, and mm. knowing it's a formal thing. But you're right now thinking, you know, the size of your team, if you can improve things by one, back to the one percent, we wouldn't even think of the one percent. But yeah. uh, the bigger your team, then is the, the and the bigger your business is, then the bigger the opportunity, I guess, for yeah. the gain, the impact. Yeah. In, in, incredible. Yeah. So yeah, part of our we've three things we're focusing on this year. It's, it's people. Uh, process and productivity yeah, but yeah. we know if we invest in and look after people and that'll roll into processes and we look at the processes and how we can do, do things better mm -hmm. and that might be adding new things and taking things out yeah. it should actually ironically improve our productivity as well so yeah. um but all all it definitely be, be marginal yeah. <laughs> and everywhere don't want to change too much so uh, it's very interesting to, to understand that's a, that's a real mm -hmm. concept out there and look i would be very supportive of the ordering as well that you have on that i mean i like the three p's it's, uh, it's a good northern <laughs> ireland uh, <laughs> easy to remember well, easy to remember uh, but I, I, in particular not just that they all begin p i like the order that you have you know the, the people bit mm -hmm is the most important. I mean, you could argue that the product and the process will happen automatically if that's, you get the people bit. That's what I'm hoping. Um, <laughs> and that, well, it, I, would, I would encourage you that it will. Mm -hmm. and, and even if you think about your own experience in life, whenever people feel um, roles that you've been in in your own uh, career to date, and anybody watching this, mm -hmm. I would encourage them, think about the favourite job, the 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 best boss you ever had, the best team that you ever played or worked within, and think about why it was your favourite. Why was that person, that boss, the one who inspired you or the one who you respected, the one that you were loyal to? And quite often it comes down to a very, very simple human thing, and that is that you understood, you knew that that person cared for you. They were interested in you and how you were doing. And whenever people feel that they're being cared for, when they understand that and they see that in the actions of how they're treated, whether the business allows them to be flexible, to go and you know pick up the youngster from the, the doctors and to live their life because their, their employer cares about them, you will automatically find that those people will do the very best they can to improve process and to improve productivity because they want to pay back the care that they get from their employer. And I think that's a very fundamental human trait. Um, again, the management consultancy term for this is reciprocity. If we, if we care for people, people care back. Okay. Um, I got asked a question when I was speaking at, at an event on this topic about six months ago, and somebody from the floor asked the question, how, uh, how can we as an employer um, get, get better loyalty from our people? And, I mean, my answer to that question is, well, if you want more loyalty back, if you want that reciprocated back, well, then you have to be more loyal to your people. The business has to be more loyal to its people. And if it is, the people will be loyal back. You know, loyalty is a two-way street. Care is a two-way street. And uh, quite often, the analogy of human relationships comes into any management discussion that we have. This is a, it's about humans. It's not about management or about business. Humans like people who are nice to them. That's something that hasn't changed for maybe the last 200,000 years of our human evolution. Mm -hmm. We've all sorts of technology now, but we really haven't changed very much. We still want to stay with people who care for us. And it makes perfect sense to do that. You're safer there. You're personally going to do better if you stick with people who care for you. And uh, I think we're very, very quick, and so we should be, we're very, very quick to reject a relationship whenever we understand that the other party doesn't reciprocate the care that we are investing in that relationship. We will very quickly realize, I need to spend my time somewhere else. And we turn on our heel and we go looking for someone else. And that I think that's a dynamic that we would see a lot when we work with sales teams um, whether it be helping them to just improve sales performance. You know, how do we build those relationships with customers that 
that are going to drive our business forward and uh, give us the income that we need to keep growing the way we want to grow. Uh, and I think it all reduces down to that same very simple dynamic. Your customers will stay with you if they know you care about them. If they feel that you don't care about them or they don't see that in the way that you treat them, they're going to go back off somebody else. Incredible. Excellent. Uh, uh, so much to think about now today. I'm thinking oh, uh, I have a lot to do. So, And you mentioned at the start of the conversation sales. Mm -hmm. So sales is obviously critically the lifeblood of an, any yeah. company. Yeah. Uh, so you, you help companies understand their sales processes and yeah. what they're doing with sales and opportunities. Yeah. Would you have any uh, general advice or where would you see, uh, I guess, companies make errors or miss opportunities? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, a lot of the stuff I could say here would be almost covering things I've, I've already said, you know, about um, making sure that when you're in a sales role, you understand that your job is to demonstrate care to customers. Mm -hmm. It's not to go out and close deals. Uh, a lot of sales training is very tactic driven and it's very much uh, geared towards how do you make somebody say yes when they don't want to say yes. I th don't think that's sales. Um, you and I were chatting just before the camera started rolling mm -hmm. about sales and I gave you my, my definition of what I think sales is. And sales is about creating a mutually beneficial transaction. Now, in common language, that means making win-win situations. And now, personally, and maybe I'm biased because I've been in sales most of my life, mm -hmm. um, I think sales is a, an incredibly noble thing for anybody to do in a business. I think it is a, it's something that people should be proud of. You should be proud to be in sales if your definition of sales is to create mutually beneficial transactions. Because you're you're making things happen that create a win for somebody else and create a win for you. I just think that's a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, now, if your definition of sales is you make somebody say yes when they want to say no, I don't think that's sales. I think that's fraud. That's where somebody has doorstepped an old lady and made her buy a conservatory mm -hmm. that she doesn't need. Now that's not sales, that's theft, that's fraud, um, and that's not sustainable. That you may get transactions to happen with that sort of fraudulent approach, but you're not building a long-term relationship. And the only way to profitably trade, I would argue, or, or for a business to, to grow profitably, is to build relationships where your cost of sale is invested at the beginning, but you never have to reinvest it. Because the relationship persists forever. So you might have had to spend a bit of money driving about and drawing up proposals and, you know, sort of dating, if you like, you know, and getting to know each other and all that sort of stuff. That can be quite an expensive pr process for a sales team. But that only is profitable if you just invest it the once. If you're having to do that every single time you want one transaction to happen, you're going to be outcompeted. By businesses who do care for their customers and who can retain relationships for the long term. So um, now I'm maybe waffling at you here, but I suppose to answer your question directly, you know, what tips or advice might you give? Um, I think to try and summarise that, I would say that um, sales teams and any person involved in in a sales team or in a sales process in a business, um, they need to focus more on what the customer wants and whether they can deliver it, rather than focusing on what they've got and want to shift. You know, it's not about, sales is not about telling people what boxes we have lined up in the storeroom. Sales is about talking to people, understanding what their problem is, and being able to get the win for them. If we can fix the problem that they have, if we can get them to have the win on their side of the formula, they will reciprocate by passing the win back to us and typically that's an invoice or a check mm -hmm. you know or, or work next month yeah. um, and I think the tactical that that old school sort of shyster type sales you know how do you trick people into saying yes and how do you make them buy it I just don't think that works not long term no you, not long term yeah. you'll get the transaction but you're not gaining a customer you're just nicking something out of somebody's pocket and as soon as they find out, mm -hmm. they're, they're going to try and get you back. Mm -hmm. Or they'll certainly never talk to you again. Mm -hmm. 
And again, that's not that's not sales to me. That's fraud. It's all about reputation and online and uh, uh, referrals. Actually, as you said, the cost of right and the cost of business. Now, as yeah. you're right to yeah. point out, you, you've invested yeah. so much time. But actually, if you can maintain a relationship with a client or a customer yeah. and get the yeah. The monthly engagement or every couple of months to come back for something new yeah. and then referrals it's yeah. uh, incredible that you're absolutely spot on and i mean the line of work that you're in mm. you know that's a fairly recent phenomenon where um, customers have been democratized in the sense that they can t they can make referrals good and bad with the click of their fingers they can tell thousands of people in an instant whether they're happy or upset yeah. with how they were treated so if people feel that they lost in a sale, they now have social media through which to vent their anger. You know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, if somebody went into a shop and bought a pair of trainers and the sole fell off, and they went back to the shopkeeper and said, look, will you replace these? And they told him to go take a hike. You know, tough, tough luck, mate. The only customers, potential customers, that that individual could reach were their immediate family by word of mouth. Jimmy, don't be going to a sports shop there. They're a disaster. They sold me an old Duff pair of trainers and I wouldn't take them back. We now live in a world where if somebody gets a Duff pair of trainers, 100,000 people can know that afternoon about the poor customer service. So the reputational risk has, has, has greatly increased and should have greatly increased. You know, it, it's not right that, um, that companies should be allowed to essentially defraud a customer and get away with it um, and social media makes sure now that we live in a world where it's literally impossible now to get away with a company promising one thing but delivering another you will get caught out and rightly so for sure and and thinking of all the, the planning and strategy that we're discussing here mm -hmm. do you think companies still should have a formal business plan and a formal strategy where they're plotting out the, the path ahead um, I, I think that, in short, the answer is yes. I think every business should have a plan for where it wants to get to. And uh, again, I think in Northern Ireland, this can quite often be a, a challenge for a lot of people, where the business kind of rolls on. It goes where it ends up going, and we are all kind of running after it, <laughs> trying to keep up. Um, but that's not right. I mean, from a shareholder's perspective, that's just not good enough. Um, the business should be going to where it wants to go to. It, it should have an end in mind. It should have a destination. It should know, I want to, in six months' time, I want to be in Tahiti, sitting on a beach. It should have the, that clarity of vision. Not vision in a mission sense, like we want to be the best provider our customers have ever worked mm -hmm. with or anything sort of grandiose and totally unmeasurable. Uh, we believe that strategy should be something that you should either know if you've missed it or hit it. You're either sitting on the beach in Tahiti in six months' time or you're not. And uh, But I'm when I say yes, they should all have a strategic plan, I'm not saying they should have a 150-page document that gets written and is very expensive to build and goes on a shelf and is never looked at <laughs> thereafter. A strategic plan is only of any value if it is routinely used and updated. And my analogy with Tahiti there that I gave you, if you think about, let's say you and I decide, let's go to Tahiti, and we've got a wee yacht tied up at Belfast Harbour. Now, Tahiti's our destination. The first thing you and I need to work out is, well, where is the boat? What size is it? What's it got? What sort of kit do we have? Do we need crew? Do we need food? What resources are we going to need to get us from where we are here mm -hmm. to Tahiti on the map over there? But once we've got the map out and drawn the wee squiggly line and put the X at Tahiti, it's of utterly no use to us if we then fold that map up, stick it in a drawer and don't look at it again. Just start sailing. Every day or so, you, you and I are going to have to take the plan out and look at where we are, you know, take a few measurements with a sextant or whatever and work out where, are we where we wanted to be. And if we're not, how do we adjust to get back on course? And sometimes things might change, the wind might come from a different direction, uh, Brexit might turn out a way that we weren't expecting it to turn out, and that big iceberg might loom up in front of us. Um, but strategic planning, I think, it's not that the exercise in itself makes everything easy, but it can bring competitive advantage. We can't change whether that iceberg's there or not. 
but we can react. And if we react quicker than the next yacht beside us, who we're racing to Tahiti to get that two, those two sun loungers, um, if they smack into the side of the iceberg and we don't, then we've gained a competitive advantage from the fact that we had a plan, but we were willing to adjust mm -hmm. and that we were able to correct or to get ourselves back on course. Mm -hmm. So uh, I suppose yes is the short answer. We, companies should have a strategic plan, um, but that plan needs to be in a simple and a flexible format that allows the business maybe on a monthly or on a quarterly basis to review progress against the plan and to adjust the plan if necessary. If you don't have that strategic review routine, I don't care what your plan's like. It's never right and you're never going to get to where it was you wanted to get to. The plan is worthless without the routine. Mm -hmm. And I suppose a, a phrase that we would quite often use when we're talking to directors about this is let's just realise right at the very start the plan is always wrong. So when we get to Tahiti and you and I are sitting on the sun lounger and we take out the map that we followed and we look at the red line that we drew to get there. Mm -hmm. We arrived on time, but we didn't follow that exact course because whenever the big iceberg popped out, we decided that, well, we'd better go south and get around that and then we'll rejoin our course and get back on. So the importance of the plan is not that the line is exactly step by step correct for every day. What makes the plan useful is that it is a, a guide for us to make sure that we are always able to adjust to ultimately get to our destination. But I, I'll make a guarantee for you, mm -hmm. there has never been a strategic plan in history where when you look back in hindsight, everything happened the way it was written in the plan. The plan's always wrong, but that's okay. The important thing, the thing that gets us to Tahiti is not that the plan's 100% right. The thing that gets us to Tahiti is that you and I are checking on a regular basis, where are we, where should we be, and how do we need to adjust in order to get back on track so you and I are sitting on a sun lounger drinking cocktails out of a coconut. Very, it sounds very appealing. <laughs> so I'll pick you up on that offer. I'll be it. Done. Date in the diary. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, again, when I look back at our, our plans, the biggest thing that I see is we, we've often misjudged the time, the time taken. So mm. we think we'll do something in a month and it takes us six months. Yeah. Or five months, so it is, yeah. uh, as you say, incredible to, to think that uh, we never got a <laughs> rather plan right. How can we build in? So, again, we're all busy in our, our, our work, you're, you're mm. giving us more things to do. Mm. It's like, oh no, not another thing to do. Yeah, uh, you're, you're killing me. Uh, so, how can we build something like that into our routine, or we just need to accept yeah. that it's so so important to our business? You've summed it up there at the end. It's, it's understanding just how fundamentally important it is, it's not a nice to have. You know, if let's go back to our Tahiti trip. Can't wait. Um, if you and I genuinely want to get there, the only way we're going to do that, do that, the only way we'll make that plan happen, is by getting the map out, being disciplined, drawing the route that we would like to take, and having that the routine built into our daily activity on the ship to make sure that we're making the adjustments necessary. Mm -hmm. It's about discipline. And that discipline comes from the fundamental understanding that we're not just doing this for the crack. We don't just look at the map because we bought a map. Uh, we look at the map because we know, uh, we're confident that that is giving us the best chance of putting our backsides in those sun loungers. Um, so it's not a kind of a one or other. It's not about... Uh, well, should we choose to do the stuff we need to do day to day or should we choose to do the long-term strategic planning? Um, you have to do both. And again, that's back to the LMO, the lead, manage, operate thing. The more senior we become, the more of our time and the more disciplined we need to be in making sure we apply the necessary time or invest the necessary time in doing the leading piece that's ultimately going to help take the business to where it wants to go to. Mm -hmm. If we don't do that, if we don't invest that time on that leadership activity, we're not doing our job. Yeah, very good. Well, you mentioned lead, and I guess leadership. So leadership is basically 
making sure we take time out of our business and mm -hmm. look at the strategy and full yeah. plan. Is that yeah. It? yeah, the oh. leadership piece, I suppose, in, in simple terms is, is about looking forward. Mm. It's about looking at where, where we're going, where we should be going, who we should be building relationships with in the longer term. And the, the, so leadership is quite often akin to strategic type stuff um, or strategic activities. Management is quite often about managing what is happening. So it's more about the, making sure that the team are doing the right things. And then operating is, is almost an individual thing. What am I doing to help the team to get stuff done? Mm -hmm. uh, and the more senior you become, I mean, arguably when, uh, when a leader finds themselves in a position where they are running a business, and you'll, you'll find this if you look at um, any of the sort of publicly known, the great business leaders of our age out there, the likes of Richard Branson and mm -hmm. um, I suppose Jack Welsh would be one that I grew up with in my time and read a lot of books about. Um, they spent, w when they reached the pinnacle of their career, they weren't doing any operating. They weren't phoning up any customers and saying, do you want to buy some stuff? They weren't, you know, packing boxes down in the warehouse to shift turbines across the world. Mm -hmm. They were spending all of, almost all of their time was talking to people, listening to people, and thinking about where the business was going. Uh, and I think for any of us who want to progress in our management mm -hmm. career, that's a proportion that we need to be shifting. Mm -hmm. uh, and discipline is, a, as I mentioned earlier, discipline's a big, big piece. Mm -hmm. Um, a, f a little phrase that we often tell managers in our in our lead like an owner program that you're not allowed to use. If you're a manager, if you're responsible for other people, you're never allowed to say these words. And those words are, I'm too busy. If you ever find yourself saying, I'm too busy, what you're essentially doing is you're self-diagnosing that you are a bottleneck. You're now a constraint on the business. You're doing things that either you shouldn't be doing, you're perhaps operating, digging the hole when you should be helping other people to dig the hole, um, or you're, you're not empowering the people around you to oversee the digging of the ditch. Um, but I'm too busy is a phrase that I, I think it's, it's a it's good for all of us to be disciplined enough to say, I'm never going to say that. And if I catch myself saying it, and by the way, I say it myself. I find myself frequently saying it, certainly inside my head. I'm too busy to be doing this. But as soon as we hear ourselves say those words, hopefully that should give us a wee dig in the ribs. And we can think, ah, oh, well, hold on. Why am I too busy? Should I be too busy? Am I doing too much of the operating? Am I doing enough of the managing? Am I leading things in the right direction. Uh, so that's a neat wee almost trick, a wee mind trick mm -hmm. to bear in mind. We're never allowed to say I'm too busy if we're in management. Incredible. Excellent. So uh, those loads of tips and advice today. So what companies or types of companies do does Lincoln Bay better work with? Um, I suppose the bulk of our clients would be the, the, the classic SME, somewhere between maybe 15, 20 employees up to a couple of hundred, mm -hmm. uh, with a few exceptions to that rule. Um, there's a few startup companies that we provide support and direction to, um, and we have some quite nice large clients uh, employing maybe a thousand or a couple of thousand people. Uh, although, when large clients hire us, I think they hire us because they like the SME approach. They like that the sort of more practical, uh, gritty approach about people trying to change their own activities and taking responsibility. For their own personal changes, um, but the, I mean the, the bulk of our clients would be on the island of Ireland. Uh, we've a few, a few clients in London. We've uh, a client in the east coast in the states. We've a client out in um, the United Arab Emirates, of mm -hmm. all places. Um, a client in Monaco, uh, which is again a bit of an outlier. We'll maybe take the yacht to Monaco yeah, instead of Tahiti. Take that one. Um, so we we work with um, and we're we're sector agnostic. Is the other uh, another phrase that we use? We're we're not particular to any one sector. We work with engineering companies, with food companies, uh, with services businesses, um, construction. We yeah. name it. Very good. And what what what's the services then? You you go in and support the the senior team. 
Yeah, uh, the three words I suppose that we always use when somebody says, what is it you actually do? Um, the three words are strategy, leadership and performance. So strategy, it tends to be about the trip to Tahiti, for example. Mm -hmm. um, facilitating discussions with the board of directors about where do you want to go? What do your shareholders want from the asset? What future should you be trying to create in this in this company? And that is very much about facilitation. It's not about us telling people you should go to Tahiti. It's about helping them think about, sort of get their head out of the daily operation, think about where they want to go in the long term, and then take them through a planning process and challenging them as well on that, on the journey that they see, challenging, challenging them or, or sense checking it to make sure that it's feasible. Um, so that's the strategy piece. The leadership piece is quite often just running internal leadership development programs. So helping to upskill the leaders and the managers in their business to help support the accomplishment of that plan. And then on the performance piece, that quite often manifests itself in sales team development. So you're working with a team who are at the operational or executive or customer facing uh, side of the business and helping them to examine look, why is it we do what we do and can we improve what, what little continuous improvements can we be adopting? Should we be washing our hands more often or, mm -hmm. or whatever? What can we do to, to improve the contribution that we make to the business? Incredible. And, and you're also a director in a few uh, businesses as well, which is <laughs> very uh, yeah. interesting. So yeah. you, you, you find then sitting on boards and, and giving guidance as well is, yeah. gives you a good oversight of what's happening in, in the industry out there? Yeah, I, I suppose I'm, I'm non-executive chairman of three different businesses at the moment and it, the thing I like about that and I've, I've been a non-exec director um, for quite a while um, but the thing I like about it is that it's it's very efficient in terms of time um, it, so it doesn't absorb a huge amount of my work and week um, to be involved but you're involved in very very interesting discussions you really are at the sharp end of things because you're you're an outsider but you're in the team that is guiding a business and I mean, without talking myself down here, a lot of the value that a non-executive brings to a board is their naivety. It's because they don't work in the business mm -hmm. that they can ask the stupid questions mm -hmm. and they can say, look, what, why do we do this that way? Why is that? And if, if you've been in the business for a long time, you don't challenge the status quo. It's hard to challenge it because you know why we do it that way. Well, we did it that way because whenever we started the company, we found that that was the way that worked best. But the world is constantly changing. You know, the sand is shifting under our feet. Mm -hmm. The icebergs are popping up. The wind's changing direction. The, the environment around us in business is constantly in flux. And a good non-executive director, I would argue, is somebody who knows nothing about the sector in which they're working. Um, well, I would quite often see adverts posted for you know a non-executive director for um, a medical company or something mm -hmm. like that, um, and you know we want a non-exec director who has medical sector experience, and I always raise an eyebrow when I see that, because sector experience is not what brings value from a non-exec director. Um, I I'll always go back to that point. I think it's your naivety that helps. Um, and being in a non-executive role, I have to say, for anybody who's thinking of doing it, I would encourage you to, to do it. It's an incredibly rewarding, interesting role to play, where you're within a team, you're, you're the stupid one in the team. You know, you're the one who doesn't know about the sector, who doesn't know the techni technical aspects of the product, but you... you that actually puts more pressure on you then to try and find ways to add value and I think that brings out the best in you um, because it pressurises you because it's difficult and tough um, and I have to say I, I find that very very enjoyable I love it incredible excellent and you've got some an industry we're very passionate about here is obviously uh, tourism yeah. and the tourism industry here in Northern Ireland and Ireland as a whole yeah. so you've got some experience in that so you see massive changes in tourism here and um, well, yeah, I suppose, again, the short answer is yes, uh, and, and you'll probably know this yourself from clients who you'll work with in the sort of food and drink and tourism um, sectors. And I think it's something that um, Northern Ireland should be and probably is rightly proud of. Um, I think we're maybe a little bit 
too humble still as a as a nation. Yeah. We're, uh, I think we don't often realise just how how amazing this little place is. We now frequently say to people that Northern Ireland is just a little village, and it is. You know, when you travel anywhere else in the world, you've you know, you could go to Wolverhampton, probably has a population as big as Northern Ireland, you know, and that's not international. But when you go to really big cities, really big countries and population centres, you realise just how teeny Northern Ireland is. But yet, whenever you look at the impact that we can make in this wee country, um, when you look at the natural resources that we have, when you look at the destination that this place is for people coming from all of those other big nations who are world powers economically and who have you know phenomenal resources and um, huge indigenous businesses and then they come to we northern ireland they love it here and they're right to love it here because being a wee village is brilliant mm -hmm. you know standard of living in northern ireland mm -hmm. for a lot of now i'm not saying for everybody but for a lot of people it really is a great place to live if anyone wants to reach out get some help guidance from yourself or mm -hmm. the link of your team what's the best way for them to do that um i would uh i would encourage anybody to contact me mm -hmm. um more than happy to take an email with a question i'm more than happy to meet with anybody for a cup of coffee and a chat just like you and i are having this morning mm -hmm. um and my email address you can probably put links or something we on will. can you but it's john at link .com. excellent and uh, so basically the website's the best place then via the website or through that that email yeah i, I would encourage people drop an email to me directly because right. if anybody's good enough to take the time to have reached this point in the video uh they they at the very They're least interested. deserve to have a personal response excellent. uh from me to any question that they might have wow. and i would encourage anybody do please drop me an email if you've a challenge a question if there's something that you and I've talked about today Kieran um, if they would like a look at that wee slide that I'm going to send yeah. you um, I would be more than happy to invest the time yeah. to talk to them so incredible no, very generous so thank you very much so we'll be sure to have uh, your email and the links to your uh, website underneath this video and in the article that it's embedded as well so thank so you very much for your time today Thank you, Kieran. Really enjoyed it. Brilliant. Thank Good you. Good luck. And thank you for watching. Hopefully, you enjoyed this uh, video today. Uh, my name is Kieran from Profile Three. We're the content marketing agency based here in the Innovation Factory in Springfield Road in beautiful Belfast. So make sure you tune in for tomorrow's video. Talk to you soon. Thank you again.